Hey Atari hackers, are you struggling to rank your website in Google? Or are you struggling with the recent spam and helpful content updates or any of the core updates that came out really? Well, in this episode, we are going to be sharing five fresh SEO strategies for 2023s that can temper or tame these recent Google updates and that will help you do better this year. These tactics will help you find the kind of keywords that your competitors will never find. They will help you implement EEAT on your site even if you're not buying all the products you're reviewing and a bunch more. So without further teasing, let's get started with the episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Atari Hacker Podcast. I am your host, Gareth Breton. And in this podcast, we're going to be talking about five things you can do this year to get more traffic to your site using SEO and a bunch of other tactics. You can listen to this podcast on all the podcasting platforms. So just look for the Atari Hacker Podcast if you're on the audio version. We also collect all the links regarding this podcast on atarihacker.com slash podcast. You can find all the previous episodes there. You can find all the links we mentioned. You can find any tools we mentioned, anything like that. So if you've missed something that you wanted to listen to, go on atarihacker.com slash podcast and you'll find all of this there. Now, obviously, if you like these shows, don't forget to like, subscribe, do all the stuff that you know how to do. This really helps us. And this really encourages me to every second week ask Mark, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I still have an answer for you. It's going fine, I guess. Um, but if you want people to subscribe, you're going to have to try a little bit harder, you know? Oh, it's brilliant. You know, 2023, the best year ever. Like, like and follow. <laughs> exactly. Like it's a, it's not really a good incentive. But yeah, it's it's kind of a tradition asking Mark how's going. Check Mark. Let's go to the podcast now because I know you hate this moment. So let's go into that. And I want to go into the first tactic, and that is going to be pushing info content hard. So historically, if you've like listened to us, etc., we've been pretty heavy on like making affiliate content heavy sites. Uh, and I'm not really necessarily a really big believer of like, oh, you need X info content on your site to uh, rank on Google, etc. But what I believe is that Google is trying to push, you know, real experts, real people like who do like they, they're trying to push EAT, basically EEAT now because they added expertise to it. That is something that you can achieve with info content. And I think that is something that is going to be a positive signal on top of being pretty good to monetize with ads. Obviously, like ads RPMs are going down quite a lot right now, right? It's like uh, there's, there's kind of like a bit of a panic on Twitter, etc. People are like uh, a little bit worried, but it's still pretty good. You know, I actually looked at our site. Okay, it's it's not, it's back to like where it was September last year for us right now. So it's like it's not the super highs of like November, etc. So it looks kind of like a, a big way down from the last few months. But we're making on our sites at least around the same way we made last September. So I still think it's a pretty good monetization method given the amount of effort you have to put in the content uh, on top of pushing your expertise, basically. The big thing for a lot of ads keywords is the competition level, right? It's significantly lower than um, many of the affiliate uh, commercial keywords that, that we've been targeting. So there's a lot of opportunity there um, to actually like rank very highly yeah and the thing as well is like um what's quite interesting is that obviously ai content is a, is a really big thing in the industry right now and for a long time google was like all ai content is spam you should not use this it's terrible etc right and for the first time recently danny sullivan in on november 7th uh replying to i rank michael king i think he's uh he's like a pretty big seo in the industry said that uh, we haven't said AI content is bad. We said pretty clearly content written primarily for search engines rather than human is the issue. That's where we what we focus on. So if someone fires up 100 humans to write content just to rank or fires up the spinner or AI, same issue. So really what they're saying is they're going after shit content, not necessarily AI content, which uh, for me, it kind of like is a match made in heaven for long tail keywords because there's still lots of processes you can use to speed up the creation of content with AI, help it, you know, have it help you write some paragraphs, have it help you do some research, etc. And so creating that long tail info content that will, you know, boost your topical authority, boost your basically uh, authoritativeness about the topic. Potentially you can monetize with ads pretty well. We're doing that. We have some sites with semi AI content that is monetized with ads now and it's ranking well and it's doing fine despite all the recent updates. Uh, I think all together that makes me really want to push in for content this year. Yeah, and I think the one of the problems with all these AI tools that have been released over the last couple of years has been the the marketing of them. They have not so subtly positioned yeah. themselves as oh, just press this one button and get your article. Now, anyone who's actually used them knows that the output is not going to be that that great. So, as you said, using it instead, especially with ChatGPT and the possibilities that that we've been learning about in the last couple of months with that, 
um, to, to just use it as more of an assistant. And there are certain areas where it does a really, I, I would say almost a better job than some decent human writers. For example, in writing intros, if you already have an, an article or, you know, summarizing uh, more complicated, you know, medical journals or scientific papers uh, and breaking things down to make them easier to understand. But you still have to kind of put all the bits together and oversee and check the final output, right? You can't just, rel uh, you know, rely on it blindly. What's working really well for me with it right now is like actually doing the research part. So like um, researching the information, I do what, you know how people are content, people are bullet points, right? It's just, I just make like a lot, a lot of bullet points, links, whatever. Like I just throw all my shit at there, but I don't write full sentences, right? I'm like, oh, make sure you do this and uh, check this out or whatever. And add like resources, stats, interesting stuff that are interesting. But now I figured out I can actually copy paste these bullets into ChatGPT and have it output a pretty decent article or video script um, for me to use. Obviously, I need to like go through it and edit it and sometimes re-add things, etc. in there. So I need to get kind of like have one full reread about it and just you know make it make it me basically. But it does a really good job at taking my notes and doing something cool. But the output when you give it all the bullet points is 10 times better than when you just ask it like, oh, write an article about X topic. Like you see all the YouTube videos and everyone getting so excited about, oh, write an article about X topic. That is super beginner level. You know, it's like, it's not how you do this. My opinion, you you kind of input the facts with your research. You give it to the, to the AI and the AI can make a pretty decent article using these facts. And it is a good article because, you know, it's your research. It's what you wanted it to say. Yeah, so if you want actually... Uh, Aleda Solis has released a really good uh, chat GPT comments uh, blog post where she has shared a bunch of her comments and how she uses chat GPT for SEO. So if you are thinking of using AI to create info content, and honestly, I think I would encourage it provided you do what we say, which is like, you know, prepare your note, do your research, edit it, etc. Uh, I would recommend you go check out that blog post. It's been really good. Uh, I'm thinking of making a similar blog post because I have different ways that I use it. So I might actually make one now that I'm back to writing blog posts, basically. <laughs> um, so it's like, uh, it, sorry, Aleda, I'm, not, I'm still in your concept, but uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different if I do it. But yeah, go and check it out. Uh, I would recommend pushing for content using AI but do it the smart way. Don't be that fucking robot pressing that button, uh, generate, 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 not reading the content and pasting it on this article on your site. I think you will not do well with Google Updates this year if you do that. Have they announced uh, pricing for ChatGPT or, you know, it's kind no. of in this like free stage at the moment? It's still in the free stage and actually Bing has announced that they will roll out some kind of version of this in search as soon as March from what they say, obviously it could be delayed. Like, you know, it's like, I'm pretty sure they just scrambled something together based on the interest and they're like, oh, we can actually make Google really annoyed about this. or like maybe take a little bit of market share from them because actually Microsoft is a big investor in open AI, right? So they, they actually invested a billion in 2019 or something like this. Like, um, so they, they get to do this. My question is, if this is going to be in Bing, is this going to be a very limited version of this? Or maybe we'll just answer questions or something, like not really like write code or do what, whatever ChatGPT is doing. Uh, because if that's the case, then I don't see how they would charge for it on the site if you literally have ChatGPT for free on Bing, uh, unless there's Bing Premium or something. Um, but So I think it's, it's questionable how it is. Um, I'm also wondering if Microsoft might even be financing ChatGPT as it is now until they launch it on Bing to keep the demand going so that people switch to Bing when they, when they when they put it on Bing, you know? So like, you know, we keep using it and they're like, well, now it's moved to Bing. And then you become a Bing user all of a sudden, you know? Yeah, and it's interesting as well. So despite the name OpenAI, it's it's not like an open source thing as such, right? No. It's a it's a commercial for profit company that's actually that's it was started as a non-profit initially right they, they they just made it so their goal was to make ai that is not uh like that is benevolent to humans that was pretty much the the stated intention but i think now that they're striking gold <laughs> uh, i could see them uh i could see i mean it's gonna eventually it could be like microsoft acquiring the rest of the shares and actually becoming a proper search engine or something like this like i could see something like this happening i was thinking apple could acquire them as well uh, and build it like, you know, it could be the new Siri, for example. So they start competing with Google and they don't need to pay Google. Like uh, they pay Google, Google pays. I mean, I guess Google pays Apple. So it's not that bad, actually. 
Um, so yeah, I, a lot could happen. I don't think it's for <laughs> it's not for profit anymore. Um, but yeah, so the tactics is create info content, use AI, but use it responsibly, read the content, edit it, do proper prompts, do the work. It's not a hands-free job cre uh, content creation job. It is an assisted content creation job. That would be my first thing. Uh, let's jump onto the second one. Yeah, and in order to create uh, all that extra info content, you need to find keywords, right? Um, and so you wanted to what a transition. Yeah, <laughs> see what see what I did there. <laughs> I'm impressed. So, so I'm taking over from here. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I actually wrote a blog post about this. Uh, I, I wrote a blog post about keyword tool accuracy and I actually shared the story of two keywords in there. Uh, the first keyword which I shared, uh, which was pet blogging. So it's a keyword we wrote about on uh, Atari Hacker. Kind of makes sense, right? We have we would try to attract people who want to start websites. And we saw the stats on HF. The stats were like 4.4K global volume, including 3.7K in the US. So that was like, you know, nice traffic. Traffic potential according to HF 450, which is decent, but still a bit low for the search volume, to be honest. Um, but over and keyword difficulty six. So overall, it was like, holy shit, this is a great keyword, very easy to rank, uh, and lots of traffic. So we wrote that keyword. We uh, essentially ranked for it. We ranked number one for it quite quickly. And, and then like a few months later, I go to our SEO person. I'm like, how much traffic are we getting for that page? It must be amazing. Right. And she shows me, <laughs> and she shows me like five visits per day or something, which is like fucking terrible. Uh, and I'm like, what the hell? Like what happened with, uh, this keyword tool? Like, and then she's like, yeah, sorry. It's like, we were getting, like, if we check the rankings in even search console, average rankings, etc., we're really high. Uh, the, everything's basically okay, but we're getting 200 visits per month to that page, which is really bad. And so I was like, oh, I'm fucking Ahrefs. So then I checked SEMrush and see SEMrush has the same issue, right? So SEMrush reports 2.9K, uh, sorry, 4.6K global volume. So pretty much the same as uh, Ahrefs, uh, a bit more keyword difficulty, uh, but overall it was the same, right? So it wasn't very good. And then I compared it to like another keyword we wrote for that had 200 search volume according to Ahrefs, uh, same difficulty uh, and 100 traffic potential. So we're talking 22% less volume and 4.5 times less traffic potential according to Ahrefs. And I checked, the, uh, I checked the analytics, we ranked number one as well. And then I realized that actually these posts that showed as a much worse potential on both keyword tools, to be honest, uh, I actually ended up getting about 550 visits per month, which is two and a half times the traffic of that pet blogging keyword. And so that made us open an internal discussion in the company on like, how much can we trust keyword tools, especially for this kind of like long tail keywords. So, I mean, the first one was reported as high volume, but I would argue pet blogging is still, I would say longish tail keyword. Uh, and we realize not that much. We realize there's really a lot of discrepancy in what they reported. And then that made us think about, well, if that's the case for these keywords, it's probably the case for a lot of keywords. And, and we confirmed that on many other keywords. I just didn't show it in the blog post because I didn't want to write a really long blog post. Um, but the idea is that all SEOs are using the same keyword list provided by the same providers with the same data, right? And we're all staring at this, sorting it with the same filters. And we are wrong, like quite quite often, right? Uh, quite often, it's like we're, we're all optimizing for this keyword that it's just like supposedly has all that traffic, but really there's that keyword that doesn't show any metrics that actually gets much more traffic. And so that's one thing that we're doing more and more with keyword research these days is we are learning through the weaknesses of the tool to take what we call leap of faith of keywords where we based on like the results of like one long tail keyword we tried, we just tried to do many similar keywords, even if they show absolutely nothing in keyword tools, etc. And quite often we create pages, they don't get massive amounts of traffic, but they get very, very specific traffic that is high converting and gets like between 500 and 2000 visits per month for this kind of keywords, which is great when they're high converting. And so that's one thing that I think a lot of people and good SEOs will do this year. They will go past the data they see in keyword tools. They will get off the beaten path and they will take these leaps of faith to get wins compared to other SEOs. So what you're saying is income school were right and you shouldn't trust mm -hmm. keyword tools. Well, no, they're still useful. Uh, so it's not like, it's not like I'm not going to use keyword tools, but you need to use it while understanding the limits of what you're looking at. 
Uh, it's kind of like Neo seeing the ma the Matrix, you know. He's still looking at the Matrix to avoid the bullets, but he can bend the rules, you know. <laughs> and so, and so it's a little bit like that. The problem is like a lot of these keyboard tools, you know, similar to how AI tools paint it that you're gonna press a button and generate a blog post. A lot of keyboard tools try to look like analytics, and you feel like it's like tangible data when really these are broad estimates, right? Uh, they're based on various APIs or various data sources, which can be quite questionable sometimes, or very reputable sometimes. They also use Google APIs and stuff, right? Um, but the thing is like, just the way it feels like, look at how people are sharing their Ahrefs organic data <laughs> instead of sharing their analytics, for example. Yeah, it just blows my mind all the me. time, right? <laughs> when people do that, it's like, oh, look at look at my traffic in Ahrefs. I understand, you know, sometimes people don't want to share their exact analytics in like a public forum, but it just doesn't make sense to me when they do it like in a more private setting. It's like, well, just what does your analytics but it's say? A, it's, same, yeah. it's a fallacy of the user, right? Like Ahrefs tells you it's estimates, right? It's just that. A lot of users and a lot of this industry has now replaced Google Analytics with the Ahrefs graph data. And it's a huge mistake because it's quite wrong. Like I'm even looking at the trend on some of our sites right now, like some of our sites going up a lot right now. And Ahrefs just shows them flat, you know, like nothing's being picked up or anything. And it's like, um, it's, it's, really, it, it's really a problem because I can see like new SEOs now not using Analytics, especially with Google Analytics 4 coming out <laughs> and it being so confusing. It's a, it, it's just more comforting to just go back to the good old uh, HS traffic graph, but it's, it's a very, very rough estimate and all these things are very useful. It's much better than just shooting in the dark completely, but you need to start trying to go beyond it and kind of like fill the limits and try some, you know, it's like on a batch of keywords, maybe like five to 10% of the keywords that we'll throw in will not be backed by data by the keyword tool. We'll kind of like try you know, and see what happens. And how much of that is sort of taking a shot in the dark versus reverse engineering competitors? Like if you see another site in your industry writing a bunch of articles on a zero uh, volume keyword in Ahrefs or whatever tool you're using, does that, is that an indication that you should go for those as well? Or? Sometimes, so sometimes we do that. Sometimes we use impressions in Search Console, for example. So like you get like a little bit of impressions or like more impressions that you thought for like kind of like a distant keywords related to a page you already have. And you're like, ah, that's weird. Like we're not writing for this. And then you see you get like three, 400 impressions, but you rank like average ranking 39 or something like this, right? Um, and then here you're like, ah, that's interesting. Like I I'm wondering like how, like if we could actually get some traffic there. So you might try this keyword. And what we try to find usually is keywords that can be repeatable, right? So it's like, you know, let's say you found like a best pain bow gun for a silver level competition or something. And then you, you were like, oh, okay, then I can do best pain bow gun for best pain bow gun for, so for gold level, for platinum level, for whatever, diamond level, like all the levels of league, etc. So you try to, to kind of like uncover these stems of keywords that you can then expand into several pages. And then that's when you get a winner. Like, uh, so usually like you kind of like take a shoot in the dark with one of these or like make an educated guess based on a competitor, some Google search console data, etc. And then if that wins, then you just kind of like brainstorm literally out of the blue. Okay. What well, are very similar keywords that should have volume if this has volume, you know, and, and you go off the data because the, the keyword tools will not show you anything actually. So would you be sort of comparing your um, impressions for each keyword you're targeting, your, G, your no, GSC data versus Ahrefs data to like find the outliers there? Is that a good place to start? Uh, I mean, you don't even need to go to Ahrefs to be honest. Just just go on GSC and see what gets impressions. Like you don't even like forget Ahrefs for a second and <laughs> just go and find keywords, you know? Okay. Yeah, and, makes uh, sense. Uh, so, so I think, uh, I think that, but like it, it is not, no, I disagree with income school that like you never need keyword tools, etc. I think though, I, I honestly think that what you're saying here, like they actually meant something a little closer to it. And the don't trust keyword tools thing was know, like the clickbait headline. It. They just went a little overboard in how they marketed it. Yeah. We, I think our, our positions are actually a lot closer than, than maybe it made out to be, but yeah. I'm trying to be more nuanced about this. Like it's, it's, these are very useful tools and I would never see me doing my work without them. But I think there's like literally the, the crazy part is like these keywords 
show zero in HF, but they're in front of everyone's eyes, right? And they get traffic, they're underserved. Nobody's creating content for them as well. So competition tends to be much lower. So ranking number one is much easier. Uh, and so like the best keywords are these keywords. The, the trick is they're more difficult to uncover. Um, and I think given the fact that they have lower competition, they might be worth throwing, they might be worth you know, failing sometimes and writing about something that just gets no traffic, just because when you actually hit gold, you, you very quickly rank high, you know? Yeah, and I guess that is the benefit of listening to a 45 minute uh, podcast. We can <laughs> go through all that nuance. Um, exactly. And speaking of nuance, um, it's time to talk about commercial content and reviews. Cool. Uh, so uh, I don't get that transition. The previous <laughs> one was like, this, this is a two out of five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll power through anyway and, and hopefully improve in the next one. So we want to talk a bit about commercial content uh, because it's been, I would say, in the crosshairs of Google over the last couple of years. Um, so 13 months ago, we had the first Google review update and there's been sort of successive ones which have made some, you know, pretty big impact on the affiliate industry. Uh, you know, a lot of sites have been, been hit. Um, you know, we had a site got get hit um although it came back six weeks later so and we didn't change anything so it was a little bit what's going on there but certainly we've seen sites which have average quality review uh content where you know they're taking the amazon listing the the features and they're just kind of almost re-saying what's on that page, not really delivering much in the way of like additional value to help users make a decision beyond just regurgitating sales information, maybe picking up a little bit of um, user reviews uh, here and there and commenting um, on that. And the way Google sort of framed their review guidelines and there's, what is it, like 15 of them or something, um, that's kind of, it, it all sometimes feels like a bit pie in the sky. Oh, this would be ideal if everyone could do this. But the reality is most publishers are not going to be able to have all of their products in hand and do, you know, modern castle style reviews on all of them. And just the time, resources, money to go to that level um, is, is difficult, right? So the question's always been, well, what do small business owners, small affiliates uh, do in order to um, satisfy some of the review guidelines that Google wants us to, to, to be, be doing um, while also delivering, you know, genuinely good experience to our, our users without um, costing a ton of money or being, you know, next to impossible to, to implement. Um, and I think we found this, this site dronesgator.com, which almost perfectly encapsulates how you can do this without going crazy. Uh, so it's a relatively small um, site about drones, you know, it reviews best long range drones and a single product reviews, ra um, roundup reviews. Um, and it's done by a guy who's not a native English speaker, put it that way, um, but still manages to produce, I think really, really good content uh, while still kind of personalizing it in a in a nice way. So there's a few things I want to point out that he's doing really well. Um, the first is using uh, custom graphics in order to display uh, different things about the drones. And if we take his long range drones page, if you think about what someone searching for that keyword cares about, they obviously are interested in the range of the drone. So right at the top, he has uh, a custom image which has the different ranges of various drones that he's going to review. Great, that's providing a lot of value right there. Um, they've got the usual kind of affiliate stuff with like the intros, what's going on here. They got a, a quite nicely done table, but what really stood out to me was this YouTube video that he's done. And I think this is really, really clever and well executed. So it's a nine minute video uh, there's a few minutes here and there of his face. He's talking about the, the different drones. Uh, he has one drone um, in his hand where he's sort of showing that. Um, and I think that is one of the drones, but he doesn't have all of them. He uses a lot of stock footage, footage from manufacturers uh, in there to create this kind of like mashup while still uh, doing text overlays of like the drone features and um, quantifiable metrics, you know, range, battery life, that that kind of stuff um, in there. 
And it just creates this really impressive um, way to interact with it, with his content, which none of his competitors are, are really doing at, at, at that level. And I think that there's a lot of affiliate sites out there um, could learn from this and could implement you know some of these these things to to just make better review content that kind of competes on that level without you know going and spending five thousand dollars on a bunch of drones to you know review them all all in hand um so yeah just wanted to to sort of um highlight that this is this is an interesting way to to go there are a few other things that that he does as well like the the way he quantifies all of the metrics quite well um you know breaks breaks everything down there are a few videos not of his like embedded in there um as well so that kind of adds a lot to it um it's just just really well done page i think i mean it's it's good i wouldn't say it's like the best page i've ever seen but this feels like realistic uh realistic uh improvement to your content to the level of what google wants to see without necessarily having to buy all the products, et cetera. So without going to that extreme as well, showing like a guy, the guy is not even a native speaker. He's just doing some smart, clever video editing. It's not amazing video editing, but it's like, it's clever, but it's not like, he's not a Hollywood producer, you know? Um, and I think that's what's good. I think looking at that example, it's like, it's a really good inspiration for a lot of people who are like starting sites this year, for a lot of people who feel like they're getting crushed by big, uh like you know big corporate uh, publishers things like that uh because this guy's like handling his own like he's like he's getting like uh 68k traffic according to hrs which is pretty decent for a consumer niche for such a new site for like a thing like a, you know hrs underestimate so he's probably over 100k traffic and the commission is like you know when you sell a drone you can make a fair amount of money dji has an effort program as well um so yeah i think this is realistic and also he's on youtube and he shows his face and he does all this stuff like it's it's good like that's that's what you should go for uh if you want to level up your commercial content but you're not really a fancy youtuber or something like this check this guy out uh let's go on the next one which is build passive links what is a passive link great great transition there i'd give that a three out of five uh, for, for your <laughs> one so most of us will be familiar with active link building where we're doing actual work on an ongoing basis to get more links. So that's, you know, reaching out for a guest post or for link insertions or Haro, the, this kind of stuff where you're, you're doing work every day, every week, every month. Now, passive link building is where you make a piece of linkable content and okay, you may have to update it once a year or something, but in general, that piece of content will just attract links based on the, the structure and how good it is and the, the key, keywords that you've you've chosen for it. So we've been experimenting with this a little bit on Authority Hacker recently. Um, in 2022, we did a big link building survey and we interviewed like 750 people uh, about link building, uh, collected all the data, did some data analysis on it, made some nice tables and graphs and pulled out some really actually interesting insights. Uh, you can find that at authorityhacker.com slash link building survey. Uh, and when we made that page, we also then got a bunch of insights and combined them with other industry insights, which we found, uh, you know, from some other high quality um, sites. And then we created a link building statistics page. Uh, and within like an hour of publishing that page, it ranked, I think, number three for link building statistics. Um, so that... The idea there is that when anyone is writing a piece, an article about link building, and they need some statistics, and they Google link building statistics, will be one of the results up there. Uh, they'll come and find our page, hopefully use one of our statistics, and then hopefully link to us from it. So in that way, you can earn links passively by not doing any more work beyond the, the sort of initial setup and, and some updates. Brian Dean. Yeah. I was going to say the king of that strategy is Brian Dean, basically. And it's like, I don't think many people knew that about Backlinko. Um, but Backlinko, like, the site is like DR91 or something right now, if I remember. It's 90. Uh, it's very high, basically, especially for like an online marketing site. Like, only sites like Search Engine Journal or like sites that have been around for way longer than him uh, have achieved that level of authority in that niche. But actually, he cheated a little bit. 
Uh, and he, nobody, he really didn't advertise this as much as, uh, as probably people know, but what he did, and if you put Backlinko in Ahrefs and you sort it by Best Buy links, you will see that a lot of his top pages, not the top, top ones, like his best blog posts, definitely like the Google ranking factors, etc., got the most links. But for example, he, like his fifth page is social media users. And it's basically exactly what we did for link building statistics, except he did it for, for social media. But he did it for so many topics. He did it for like how many roadblock users are there. He, or like Fortnite's player or something like this. And he did it for like, pretty much anything he could think of that was related to tech. I think he's kind of stopped at tech, etc. But like, you know, how many people use Zoom? How many? Nothing to do with SEO, right? But he, he, he had one on how many people use Peloton at one point as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because it's kind of tech, I guess. Uh, it's tech, but, um, uh, but uh, fitness. But like, yeah, so he, he did all these that, that had nothing to do with SEO, right? But all these pages passively collected links, grew his authority, and then ended up ranking uh, the rest of his domain, basically for a lot of very competitive keywords. And that was one of the ways he did that. If you check, like for example, this social media users page, according to Ahrefs has 2,995 referring domains, right? Including links from Adobe, Shopify, Medi I mean, Medium, everyone can have it, Forbes, HubSpot, uh, Springer, Weeks.com, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like really big ones. If you're doing any kind of outreach, you know how much work and how long that's going to take you to get 2,400 links um, doing doing guest posting or, or Haro. So this is a this is a way to really over time, you know, increase significantly the the amount of links you're you're getting while not actually being too much more work um, on a, on an ongoing basis at least. Now, there's a caveat though. It does require you to. It does require you to rank for the statistics keyword, and generally you'll need to be at least a sort of medium authority site in order to to be able to do that. So it may be a little bit challenging for new sites. However, uh, we we had a Stacy McNaught uh, on this podcast a little over a year ago, I believe, um, and she was talking about the strategy where she does something like this, but then she pays for the AdWords uh, like traffic. So she she's kind of in, in above number one organic listing at the top for statistics uh, pages, uh, for statistics keywords rather, so that then she can pick up a bunch of links that way. So that's maybe a, a little hack you can use if you're a lower authority site or you, know, you wanna give it a little bit of a, a, a kickstart and hopefully get some more links uh, that way. Yeah. I mean, she was saying that her, I remember her presentation in Chiang Mai SEO about this, and she was saying that her cost per link was lower than paying a link builder to do outreach, basically. Uh, it wasn't cheap. Like, you know, I think it was like 50 to 100 bucks per link eventually, like the cost or something, but like it was cheaper than doing high quality outreach for her. Um, and most importantly, it gets you links that you wouldn't get through outreach. And that's kind of the value of this as well. Um, but actually, uh, on, on that, we actually followed Brian Dean's trail. <laughs> And uh, we went to his new company, Exploding Topics, which is, it's more of a marketing tool. It's kind of like Google Trends on steroids, I would say that. And he, it works so well on Backlinko that uh, he's doing the same now. Uh, and it's kind of, it makes sense because his company is about finding trends. So having stats about like trendy topics, it's not terrible. But like, for example, he has a, a, a page on blockchain stats that has 945 linkable domains on that domain already. He has one on beauty industry stats that has 116, etc. Um, so yeah, it, it's like, I think that probably was one of his favorite linking tactics for Backlinko. Yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely works. So why, why not? Uh, one really interesting thing I wanted to add about exploding topics is the way he structures the page. And I've seen a number of statistics pages do this is uh, so he he is rounding up statistics that are, are found elsewhere, right? I don't think uh, for exploding topics that he's creating, uh, he's doing surveys or, or no, data no, research no. to do it. I think for some of the bad things on Backlinko, he was. Um, but for exploding uh, for topics- For a lot of them, he wasn't. For, like, I mean, for Roblox, et cetera, like, no, for sure not. For, for exploding topics, he, he, he doesn't seem to be, at least the ones we're, we're looking at. But what's interesting is he's kind of writing it as if it's his own statistics. And then at the bottom of each section, like under who created Bitcoin, um, there's like sources and then it, it links to some of the pages where those statistics were, were found. But if you think about it, if you're a journalist or a, a blogger trying to find these stats, 
you Google blockchain stats, you find this page and there's the stats. You, you're likely in many cases, I think, to just think, oh, well, Exploding Topics is the source of this stat. So I'll link to them and quote them. You're probably not going to scroll down further uh, and then look through all of the six different possible sources for that section and then control F on each page to, to find where it originally came from. Maybe if you're, you know, pro journalist or something, you, you would do that. But I think it's kind of a little bit of a sneaky way of repurposing other people's It's ambiguous, statistics. you know, like yeah, he's doing yeah. what he should do, but he's laying out the page in a way that you need to walk to get the source. So yeah. it's more likely yeah. people will link to you, and which a lot of like white hat link building, I would say. It's a lot about the amb ambiguity, you know? And, and there's uh, there are many people out there doing statistics pages that don't even bother to do that, right? They just steal other people's statistics and put them on their, their page and say they're they're kind of their, their own. Um, so, you know, definitely don't re recommend doing doing that, but it's a it's a smart way of, of doing it to get more links. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah. OK, let's jump on to the without transitions. Let's jump on to the next uh, onto the next point. The next point is actually one where I kind of like publicly changed my mind, I would say, which uh, which is going always going to be an interesting one. So I've been kind of like a resistant of the EAT thing, at least from the technical perspective, like I I wasn't sure Google would be very good at finding what is authentic content and what is just someone who just rewrote authentic content, which I still am not so convinced of. But what's com like the, the point, the next point we have is it's time to actually start bringing e e e e a t now into your content and the way you run your website, i.e. leaving the lifestyle of your niche, i.e. really like starting to touch some items. You don't have to, to buy everything like this drone guy. He doesn't buy every drone, but he has a drone. He knows how this works and he's able to fine tune his content so that a drone enthusiast will not find his content complete crap, you know? Uh, and I think that's kind of like at least the level where you need to go there. But what has convinced me is not Google, it's actually ChatGPT. Uh, basically, the growth of AI content for me means that a lot, like a lot of generic content can quickly be replaced by AI content at this point. Like AI can give you something quite similar to the rewrite of a writer who doesn't know the niche of an article. Like I think even better, you could argue. And so if that is the way some content on the internet is gonna be created, the perfect counterbalance to that is to bring actual expert advice alongside it. And so my personal belief is that eventually when we look for content online, we get a mix of AI content and expert content surrounding that content, like links, videos, whatever, uh, based on the context of what you're talking about with the AI, basically. And so uh, I think that AI content and EAT are basically a combo made in heaven for a great content discovery experience on the internet. And, and that's where we're going in the future, even though I don't think Google's very good at it yet. I mean, uh, it's like I, I made a tweet yesterday where I was like, uh, you read Twitter and you think that, you know, everything's changing in the SEO industry and then you do some queries on Google and it's the same old shit content and guest posting link building that's ranking, you know? And it's like, this got like 200 and something likes or whatever. Like a lot of people agree, basically. Um, and I agree, in the current state of things it is, but like if you are trying, I mean, it depends what you're in for. If you're in for like a quick buck, uh, want, want to make money like in the next six months, or you have a site that you want to get rid of and offload, by all means, continue building sites the way we've always built them. Or like, don't bother about your niche, hire some cheap freelance writers, put some content, do some guest posting, it still works. Um, but there's no denying that over time, things are gonna change. And there's big forces at play here, big companies that are pushing things in a certain direction. The companies that are the gatekeepers to traffic on the internet, um, that are deciding on the direction to go and eventually, you just can't be completely against them. You can kind of like be an edge case of fringe, et cetera, but you need to eventually go in a direction where they want where they want content to be because they are the ones that send you content. And that's why I think, you know, taking like taking original photos, uh, getting on YouTube, I think it's one of the things that I think a lot of people are gonna have to start doing. Even if you're not a great YouTuber or something, do like, look at our podcast. <laughs> it's just us talking on the call, right? Um, this is the kind of stuff that will build this trustworthiness that will eventually pay dividends in the sense that I think initially it's just gonna prevent you from swinging up and down all the time in Google updates by leaving, like adding all these little things basically. What do you feel about that? 
Mm, so, I mean, having done that for, what, six years or something, um, like been on, on YouTube, I mean, we're not really YouTubers in, in the like nah. fighting the algorithm treadmill sense of the word, but I don't think you need to be here either, you know, if you have a, an, an affiliate site, right? It's just about showing authenticity um, in in some way, and even if it's not perfect, right? You know, the, the drone guy, I think Paul is his name, um, it's it's not perfect, it's perfect right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's at least where you need to go, you know. Like that's yeah, that's but the, but the but that that imperfection kind of adds authenticity to it in a way. Exactly. Like I, I come away from reading that post and think, wow, this guy is really passionate, cares a lot about about drones. He's just you know putting himself out there and put putting it, this content out there, and it's it's great. It works. Yeah. So I, it's like, I think you like, I don't think you need to like change your entire business, et cetera. Like keep doing what you're doing that works. It's important. You know, you kind of like need to keep an eye on what's working today and an eye on what's coming tomorrow. And it's kind of like making that smooth transition without necessarily disrupting your business, but rather slowly upgrading it to match where we're going is how you're going to survive in this industry. Right. Otherwise it's like, you know, I mean, we've been in this industry for a while. And I think if you look back in time, Mark, you can see kind of like there was waves of like how things are done. And eventually like big updates come and things change over the course of like six months to a year. And then there's kind of a reboot of the industry. It's kind of like the matrix again, like the machines come and destroy the city and reboot the matrix, you know? And so if you want to be one of the survivors that gets in the next reboot, uh, my recommendation is that uh, you start keeping an eye on these things and start kind of like implementing these things slowly. And I'm not talking about gaming the system, right? Like, sure, it's it's cool to like put some fake doctors on your about page or uh, put some cute about uh, like auto pages, etc. But I'm more talking about creating some original insights. So, for example, the statistics thing, like do some some surveys, do like have some actual videos with your face on YouTube, like this drone guy, have these kind of things, these kind of things that feel real and authentic. I think you're going to have to add uh, at least a pinch of that this year, even though I don't think you need to massively change your business this year to do fine. I don't think everything's going to change. Uh, but I think we are going that direction. And over the course of the next few years, you'll be happy if you start this year. That's That's kind of like the way the way I'm looking at it and uh, and why I'm kind of changing my mind, even though I'm not sure whether technically from the search engine perspective on, you know, finding exactly uh, high quality EAT, et cetera. It's going to help you with links. It's going to help you with connecting with people, et cetera, as well. And it's also more fun to run your site actually being implied in niche. So if you want to actually have more fun with your business, I would recommend to do that, basically. Okay. Well, I think we are done with this episode, unless you have a final word of wisdom, Mark, any, any final transition maybe to the conclusion or something? No, you put me in the spot now. I've got nothing. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you guys for listening. If you like this episode, we have over 300 podcasts already. So go on to hacker.com slash podcast. If you want to see all the other episodes, you can subscribe to the newsletter as well on hacker.com slash subscribe. Uh, we are actually emailing all these blog posts that I just mentioned, etc., And we have a free training on authorityhackertraining.com if you want to basically see a free training with me on how to start new authority sites. There is another episode coming up in two weeks, so we'll see you then. <laughs>